Good afternoon, and welcome to the second segment in our 2022 GP Solo Author Series. The title of this program today is Getting It Done. My name is Tom Urquhart, and I currently serve as the chair of the GP Solo Book Publication Board. Uh, today joining us, we have the pleasure of, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our chair of GP Solo uh, to make a few opening comments, Mr. Stephen Curley. Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, I wanted to thank everybody who's uh, not only presenting, but attending today's uh, presentation. As I mentioned in our uh, first session yesterday, uh, this is the uh, full flowering of the author uh, relationship uh, with uh, the ABA and GP Solo in particular, in my estimation. Uh, we need to not only get new authors interested in doing things, but we have to actually give them the tools to succeed. And this presentation is going to be uh, integral uh, for uh, prior authors and those considering uh, making an offering of new uh, books to the, to the division uh, to get off the ground and take that first step because that first step, as we all know, is the most difficult one in many instances. But we have many benefits, and you're gonna be learning about them this afternoon. Uh, and having a team that has been assembled to make that, the, who have been down this road and made, this, uh, made these decisions in the past will be a great aid to anyone who has never done it before. I wanted to thank Tom for that nice introduction. I also wanted to uh, reach out and thank Melanie Bragg uh, who is basically the godmother of this idea. Uh, I reached back a couple of years to uh, when we had the benefit of being in person in Las, in Las Vegas, and we were able to uh, really explore our relationships with our authors uh, to what I believe is the fullest. And that's not only receiving uh, good and uh, valuable content uh, that we can pass on to our members and others, but also to appreciate them and, and encourage them to give us more, frankly. Uh, we're very uh, lucky to have uh, the authors that we do, but we're very, very fortunate to have the volunteers to support those authors. And in particular, we have a staff uh, back in Chicago with the ABA uh, that is par excellence. And you're going to hear about them today. And the best way to hear about them is for me to get out of their way, because I want to learn about this as much as you folks want to learn. So uh, thank you very much, Tom. And I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Curley. We have what we believe to be a very interesting and informative session uh, planned today. Uh, we hope you uh, will feel the same way about it. Uh, today, we have several authors who will share their experiences around deciding to write a book, uh, determining the topic, finishing the project after their book proposal is accepted, and marketing their books after it's published. Um, I have been told that this, veil, this uh, program will be rebroadcast or available for reviewing on YouTube and a link will be provided on the GP Solo website. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started uh, speaking to the authors. Uh, after we speak to the authors, a question and answer session uh, will be held. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please post the uh, word question in all caps in the chat portion of your chat box. Also remember to please mute your mic if you're not speaking. And remember that uh, if your camera is on, we can all see you. And uh, this, this session is actually being recorded. So just bear that in mind. Uh, we are also offering a 20% discount on all books that are discussed here today. The link will be provided in the chat, as well as the link to the ABA web store where the books can be purchased. A uh, link will also be provided to the ABA book publishing author guidelines editorial and marketing section, and the author's contact information should you have follow-up questions. Uh, also, if you've decided that you're interested in writing for the ABA or you just want some additional information, please send us your email address in chat and either a staff member or book publication board member will follow up with you. At this point, I'd like to introduce our first author, uh, Michael Shanisarian, PhD, Michael is the author of 13 books and over 70 peer-reviewed periodical articles, book chapters, and monographs. Dr. Shanna Sarian first published with us uh, a decade ago. He has 35 years experience as an expert witness with more than 5,000 injury damage cases. His expertise pertains to evaluating claims of wage loss and life care plan damages. And the title of his book, Valuation of Monetary Damages in Injury Cases. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Tom. 
Our first question is, why did you choose to write this book? And in particular, why this topic? Well, I'm a psychologist by my training and I've been practicing uh, since the, let's say the early to mid eighties. And I have a lot of experience as an expert witness. I've testified in uh, several thousand cases and jury trials, depositions, and I gained a lot of expertise in that area. And as a author, I think it's important that an author writes on a topic that they know well, that they have a lot of passion, and that they can communicate something that adds value to people who potentially would be readers. So that's why I chose this particular topic. Uh, it's called a, the valuation of monetary damages in injury cases, a damages expert's perspective. And my expertise is in areas related to assessing damages, uh, namely loss of earning capacity claims, claims for future care needs necessitated by an injury, and to a degree, tangentially, pain and suffering damages. So obviously your, your target audience is attorneys. Is that correct? Well, I think there's more than attorneys. It's practitioners like myself who are experts as well, attorneys, uh, insurance adjusters as well, uh, potentially judges, uh, potentially sophisticated plaintiffs. All of those, I think, are potential markets. So I know that you've written 13 books. Uh, you're a very prolific author. So what advice would you give to, to authors that may want to write uh, specifically maybe for the ABA? Well, I, you know, over time, actually, this book was probably the least burdensome of the, of the 13 I've written. I think there is a learning curve that you go through when you're writing, and you, uh, you kind of get some ideas in terms of how to make the next book more successful. Um, I think there are three things that I would offer aspiring authors. The first is to select a subject that you truly are an authority on, that you truly are an expert on, that, that you have passion for. Um, that you can synthesize real life experiences, knowledge that you've gained. That's one thing I would recommend. Another is to keep very well organized. Uh, from the onset, what I did, I wrote a very detailed proposal to the ABA that outlined um, the book in detail. Uh, the book is in four different sections, total of 12 different chapters. Um, I set goals for myself. I, it, I started with a little bit of momentum and then you know, getting more and more momentum as I went by. And ultimately I set a goal of one chapter a month, a 30 page chapter, which is about a, a page a day, if you look at it that way. And that's not saying that I wrote every day, you know, I might write a little bit more on weekends, uh, but, but, but keep and committed to it. And then the third recommendation I would have would be to stay focused. Um, once you lose your momentum on a project like this, it takes a few days, maybe sometimes even a few weeks to, to get back to where you were before. So staying focused, concentrating, uh, keeping committed to the task at hand, I think all of those things are important when you're writing a, a book like this. So how do you plan to leverage your, your book to help with your practice or your, your business? Well, I, um, I have done this before and I just put together a spreadsheet of different ac marketing activities. Uh, the ABA I've learned has excellent resources. There's a very good author's manual, marketing manual that, the, uh, that is available on the website. Um, I downloaded it and then I took all of the different ideas in terms of how to leverage the book and uh, uh, access these different markets that I mentioned, which I'm still researching. But I've looked, I probably have about 12 to 15 different activities including contacting uh, individual states, the uh, uh, editors of different bar journals, um, asking them to review my book, um, things of that nature. It's, it's a work in progress, but with the ABA's help, I think I will have a good solid marketing plan. I know you offered uh, new authors a couple of different tips about how to stay focused and how to complete their book. Do you have any other secrets to success about uh maybe your process that you might want to share? Um, I think it's important to get other people involved to help keep you motivated. Uh, other subject matter experts, uh, bouncing ideas off of them, sharing with them parts of your uh, manuscript as it's in progress, that can be very motivating. Um, just looking at every day, what you do every day in your job, if there's ideas that you can implement, that you can synthesize, that you can add, that, that helped me quite a bit as well. I had a lot of case studies, sample reports, 
Um, even depositions that I've given, I've, I've uh, included in my book parts of transcripts from depositions to give examples and then critiquing them, what could be done better, what was good in this. But integrating what you do every day, I think, and you think of it, because you're, you're doing these two things simultaneously. You're, you're practicing and you're also writing. So if you can marry those two things together, and, and that'll enrich the content as well, because you're giving practical, applied, real-life examples. Great. Thanks, Michael. Once again, Michael's book is buying and, uh, excuse me, the, once again, Michael's book is The Valuation of Monetary Damage in, Damages in Injury Cases. Uh, thanks again, Michael. Uh, our next author that we are going to speak to is Armand Bar Bartian. Uh, Armand Bartian has been working in the art and collectibles industry since 1984. He founded the law offices of Armand R. Bartian in 1991, where his firm concentrates in the areas of art and collectibles law. Uh, Armand has contributed a bi-monthly column discussing legal considerations in the numismatic publication coin world for over 20 years. He contributed articles about the luxury art and collectibles markets for Fortune China. He's also the vice chair of the ABA Art and Cultural Heritage Law Committee and is editor of and frequent contributor to the committee's newsletter. Uh, his book is Buying and Selling Art and Collectibles, A Legal Guide. Welcome, Armin. Thank you. Armin, same question to you uh, that I asked Michael. So why write this book and why this particular topic? Okay, well, um, this book really does what I've done as an attorney for the last 35 years, which is it takes a somewhat kind of esoteric subject, very specialized subject, and translates it for a, a lay viewer or a non-specialized attorney viewer. Um, I do it in court. I've done it as an expert witness. Um, I explain legal situations to clients. So I've done it now for that sort of thing for quite a while. And I decided, well, particularly now with um, you know, prices for art and collectible items really reaching new records every week, um, this was something people would be interested in. And I'm mm -hmm. glad the ABA agreed. <laughs> this topic is very interesting. How did you get involved with art and collectibles? Well, I, um, I collected coins and stamps as a kid, which I think a lot of people uh, in uh, my generation uh, did. And uh, I was a history major in college, so it was always of interest to me. Um, but you know, in practical terms, I was working um, at a law firm in New York and I got a, a case handed to me, which involved a Tiffany lamp, a collectible art, art lamp. Uh, and the client for that was the co-chairman of an auction house. And uh, I ended up working for that auction house for four years as head of their legal department because he liked how I handled his Tiffany lamp matter so well, they hired me in house. And so after that, I was, everybody knew me and I loved the field and I kept at it. Great, interesting. So what, um... Who would you say was your target audience for this book? Well, um, my clients all want copies. And uh -huh. so that's, that's a good start. <laughs> um, it's, I'm, I look at it as um, uh, a lawyer, for example, who handles uh, an estate. Um, they're, they're representing an estate and the estate includes some art, includes some collectible items. And they want to know what should they do with it? What are the tax aspects? You know, what are things that are specific to this area? They could handle the rest of it, but the stuff that's specific to this area, that's one place that um, I would think there'd be some uh, interest. But I think businesses in the area, uh, mm -hmm. non-lawyers, but businesses, art dealers, collectibles dealers, people who just want to know a little bit about the law to know what questions to ask if they, um, if they to find out, do, do I need a lawyer for a particular sure. situation? Mm -hmm. So that sort, sort of thing. So businesses as well as as attorneys. So as an author yourself, what advice would you give to aspiring author, authors? You know, someone who's thinking about writing a book. Okay, the first, I think, I guess the first thing I would say is um, people will want to read your book. So I think a lot of people would who might be interested in writing go well. No one's going to want to read my book. 
you know, you have to have confidence in your topic. And that the, if you make an application to the ABA, they're very good about, you know, reviewing it and telling you, you know, giving you an honest opinion. Um, but the, the discipline to write a book is uh, something that I think a lot of people uh, don't have. And um, my advice, I mean, I can add to um, something that Michael said. Um, I always treated the manuscript as if it were a client assignment. Mm -hmm. Like you would always do this, an assignment for your client, right? You have something that your client asks you, well, you'll do it. You'll find the time for it. You'll schedule the time for it. And this was just like this client that was telling me you have to, you know, write this report for me. And the report happens to be your manuscript. So you schedule it in your calendar, just like you would schedule anything else. And when that time comes, you work on the book. So that I think is, is something that could be helpful to people. How do you get from you know, a, an outline to a 200 page book? Well, that's how you do it. <laughs> Good advice. Well, once again, Armin's book is Buying and Selling Art and Collectibles, A Legal Guide. Thank you for your insight, Armin. Thank you. Our next author uh, with joining us today is Gabriel Watson. Gabe's involved primarily in civil litigation. Before graduating with his JD from Lewis and Clark Law School, he worked as a firefighter and paramedic for the city of Portland, where he was a department spokesperson and member of the technical rescue and dive teams. He's licensed to practice in the state of Oregon and the title of Gabe's book is The Law of Emergency First Responders. Welcome, Gabe. Hello. Hello. So I guess uh, same questions to you to start off with. Why did you write this book and why this particular topic? Uh, the topic in this book, uh, particularly you know, coming out of a career in the fire service and, and seeing the strengths and weaknesses of the industry, as well as its impact, positive and bad on people, uh, I realized that uh, as things would happen that, that required a lawyer or some background in the area, there was just a big blank canvas with respect to where an attorney could get started, uh, understanding just the different potential potential causes of action and how they play into the, the firefighting first responder industry, uh, it's very nuanced. And, and it's just a niche that uh, where there is a lot of legal things happening, certainly plenty of exposure, but not a tremendous amount of, of context that most attorneys have. And so the goal is to provide that with this book. So this is your first book and congratulations on that. Uh, so can you tell us how you merged your experience as a firefighter and paramedic with the law when you, when you sat down to write this book? <clears throat> I, that was challenging. You know, I, I think you know, being a firefighter and paramedic, it's, it's interesting. You don't ever have deadlines. You sort of, you're sitting there. The next thing you know, you're going hundred miles an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and so transitioning into the law where everything has a deadline essentially uh, it, it, it created some unique challenges. And so to, you know, to merge those things, I suppose, uh, I want to make sure I'm answering your question, but uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's just sort of, you know, realizing from the inside what certain situations look like and, and how those aspects of that industry apply to the law or vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I ended up doing is just, you know, after a, a tremendous amount of writer's block is just, uh, putting my head into a certain call that I'd been on that was sort of complex and saying, okay, from the start of the call, these are the different issues that could arise, whether it's with dispatch or with contact or with uh, traveling to the scene, arriving at the scene, the different things you do on the scene, all that stuff. So I basically tried to sort of block it out as an emergency call. Uh, and then as certain things potentially arose, I would take notes and, and elaborate on them. So who's your target audience for this book? You know, I think that there's a, a pretty broad swath of civil litigators as well as uh, city clients who could use the book. My goal is not to create a, a guide to suing fire departments as much as it is to uh, sort of show where liabilities exist, give real solutions that can be effective in preventing those things. Then, of course, uh, where places don't observe those things, also to, to give a tool to uh, people who need to hold those those entities accountable by filing lawsuits. So uh, really anybody who has the potential to be um, 
in litigation or involved representing either city firefighters or or potentially patients and and the public. So what advice would you give to an aspiring author? Some of the things that you've learned uh, going through the process of writing. I, I you know I think what Armin says is good. That's really what I had to end up doing is, is treating it like it was a client instead of a project on the side. Mm -hmm. I, I spent a lot of time outlining and doing things I normally do when I'm writing a brief and a book is just different than that. It's, it's a, it's, it's like a one step bigger beast. And so uh, small bites and, and treating it like a client and then just sticking to a schedule because no matter what, if you think it's going to take a week, it's going to take a month. And it, it's the one thing that you can sort of put off because you're not going to go in front of a judge and explain why the next day. So uh, unless you make it a priority, it it just it sits there. It, it creates all the stress that something you're not getting done ordinarily does, but but it doesn't get done unless you make it that priority. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with ABA publishing, the whole the whole process, kind of from beginning to end, and and tell us what your thoughts on that experience uh, were? Yeah, I mean that's been great. It it sort of you know it was kind of a, a a pipe dream you put in the application and and sort of you know waited a little bit not sure like anything you send off electronically these days you cut wonder where it lands but uh sure enough about a month month and a half later i got an email and uh, that started the conversation and from that point it's been very very you know i guess conducive to getting things done very supportive and understanding i've had some things come up in my my personal life, my professional life, uh, they've been very understanding and supportive of that. And you know, they've also uh, provided a tremendous amount of support as far as tools and connections and different ideas for, for you know, breaching certain obstacles in the process. So how do you plan to leverage this book to help your, your practice or your business? Uh, you know, I just switched to a, a larger firm, but one of the things we want to do is some consulting work for cities and for those employers, as well as for first responder uh, unions. And so I think because there is such a vacuum with respect to this type of work, there are there are books that talk about the law and are more for consumption by first responders, fire chiefs and whatnot, but they don't get into the real practical legal aspects of those claims. They're more an explanation of what's informed consent or things like that. So, uh, you know, my goal is that this creates a, uh, you know, it opens the door to a conversation with clients as well as it, you know, it also opens the door to me being able to uh, work as more of an expert in that field than, than just a civil litigator who has some experience. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Gabe. Uh, once you. again, the title of Gabe's book is The Law of Emergency First Responders, and we'll go to our next author, Darren Wurz. Uh, Darren is a certified financial planner professional with an MS in financial planning from Golden Gate University. He specializes in working with attorneys, law firm owners, and couples near retirement, providing comprehensive financial planning and active investment management. He's dedicated to helping his clients transition from their working life to a comfortable retirement with confidence. He's the author of The Lawyer Millionaire, which is expected to be released in early 2022 from the American Bar Association. Welcome, Darren. Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. Our, our pleasure. So, Darren, uh, so why did you write this book and why this particular topic? Well, the, the primary reason that I wrote the book is it's a great marketing piece. Uh, for me and for my practice. Um, a few years ago, I decided to really narrow my focus, narrow my niche on serving attorneys. And really, I'm really focused on uh, serving solo and small firm attorneys. That's really where I've, where I've decided to focus. And, and the pandemic really created um, the perfect opportunity to start some new projects because there was a lot of stuff you couldn't do anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the book was really became, it was kind of something I had in the back of my mind. I wanted to write a book um, and, and really the niche was, was a part of it too. So in, in deciding what kind of a, a group I wanted to really focus on, I noticed that there was, you know, some, there was a big 
empty space. Um, I don't see a lot of, I see hardly any financial advisors who talk about really specifically trying to serve the, the needs of attorneys and law firm owners. So I kind of saw it as, as an opportunity. And then um, with the pandemic, I started to think more broadly in a geographic sense. You know, I'm here in the, the Cincinnati metropolitan area. A lot of my work was really kind of face to face. Um, but then with the pandemic, everything went virtual. So now I'm thinking, hey, you know, I can really broaden my horizons here. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. um, so the book seemed like the natural next step, you know, as far as uh, building my practice and trying to get my name out there, you know, in, in another way, you know, the, the traditional ways of marketing are more difficult, obviously, with the pandemic, you know, a lot of those networking kind of things don't exist. Um, people don't answer their phones, especially attorneys. <laughs> um, or emails, you know, people don't look at their emails, so you got to find other ways to get your name out there and get your you know, your influence out there. The other thing is there has not really been much written on financial planning for attorneys. Um, mm -hmm. There are a few books out there, but as a practicing certified financial planner, I read those books and I really found them pretty lacking in substance. And so I thought I had, you know, um, an opportunity to contribute to, uh, to the library of information that's out there. And so I uh, decided to go for it. So do you feel that this book or a promotion of this book has helped you in your, in your practice or, you know, professionally? Um, you know, that, I think that kind of remains to be seen. Uh, it has, it has it, the potential. I will say, what's that? Oh, it has the potential to do so, but we have Potential, yeah, right, okay. definitely. But one of the really interesting things is, you know, my book is really just what I do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's really helped me to really think very specifically about the clients I serve and, and really deepen my own understanding of, of how, what they need and, and the information that they need to know. So it's been a great tool for self-development for me, you know, and I'm sure the other authors might say the same thing. It really helps you think more deeply about the, the particular subject that you're working on. So it has helped me that way to really understand my audience a lot better. And then, you know, I'm already using it in my marketing, you know, <laughs> I oh, have man. it in my, my LinkedIn uh, title and my Twitter headline and stuff like that, you know, so, um, you know, even if it, the book's not out yet, you can still use it, you know, for your marketing. Mm -hmm. So did you have a process that you went through when you were going about writing this book? And can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, you know, um, I uh, was not, I was originally kind of thinking about self-publishing the book. So mm -hmm. I did a lot of research on trying to figure out, okay, what's the ideal length of a book? And from my research, it seemed, you know, somewhere around 70,000 words would kind of be ideal. So that was my target. So then I figured, okay, I created my chapter list and that was my outline it was basically my chapter list. And my chapters are pretty short. So I've got a lot of chapters. <laughs> so um, I think Mike was talking about uh, doing like a chapter a month or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my goal was really like a chapter every couple of days. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's what I was, was trying to do because my chapters are real short. So yeah, 70,000 words. I created my list of chapters. And once I knew how many chapters I had, I knew the organization for the book, and I figured out about how many words each chapter needed to be. And then I knew, you know, kind of that I was making the progress that I needed to make, because I could see about how long each chapter was. And some were a little longer, some were a little shorter. But as long as I was kind of averaging around that length, I knew I was on target. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as trying to stay on, on track, I love the idea about treating the book as a client. That's a really great idea. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the other authors were mentioning. Yeah. Uh, for me, I kind of started out, okay, so here's, if you're an aspiring author, here's something I'll tell you. You are going to get bogged down in the middle. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, you're gonna hit a point in the middle of the book where you're, you're struggling to maintain that momentum. And I think some of the other folks mentioned that, that was really, really good. 
Um, so you really do have to have a schedule. And I was, I was really bad at that at first. At first I was like, you know, just writing it in the evening, you know, but then I realized, okay, this needs to be a priority. So really it was just the first thing I would do each day when I got to the office, unless I had a meeting or something is I would work on the book and I would just make that the very first thing I did every day before mm -hmm. I did anything else, because otherwise I'd get down to the end of the day and I wouldn't have any energy or, you know, to left to really put anything together. So sure. that was kind of my process. Can you talk about your experience with ABA publishing, like kind of from beginning to end and, and talk, kind of talk through that? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's been really great. Um, the team has been really uh, enjoyable to work with, or really, um, really easy to work with. Um, we, we've gone through, so I submitted, well, it's kind of a funny story. I submitted a proposal initially when I was just first getting started and um, it wasn't accepted right away. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But I didn't give up. <laughs> oh, good. So I decided to just charge ahead and write the manuscript anyway, and I was, was going to self-publish it, I, you know, if, uh, if that, anything else failed. And um, so I, once I had the manuscript done, I resubmitted my proposal and I was like, hey, I've got, I've got the book finished if you want it. <laughs> and uh, at that point, they accepted my proposal. So I was pretty excited about that. So the first step is going through um, formatting it a little bit. So you format it and get it in the right format. And then you go through a peer review process. So somebody reads the book and provides feedback. And that was great. Uh, the peer review process was really good. There were only a few small changes um, that they recommended. And they actually pointed out some things that I needed to include. So I was really grateful for, for that process. Um, they loved the title. I, I love the title too, The Lawyer Millionaire. I think it's exciting. I think it, uh, it, it it's, it's I inspirational. My eye. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and then after that, it goes off to uh, production. So I don't know what, that's kind of where I am now um, is it's, it's gone off to production land and I, I guess we'll see what happens next. <laughs> Great. Uh, once again, the title of your book, uh, The Lawyer Millionaire. So uh, we're looking forward to having that uh, be released uh, very shortly. Thanks, Tom. Um, sure. At this point, I would like to introduce the uh, head of ABA Publishing, uh, Donna Golmer. Donna, are, are you on? I am. I am. All I right. just want to thank. I just want to thank everyone uh, for for presenting today, for serving on this panel, and also thanks to everyone who is attending and interested in becoming an author, possibly for the ABA. So, um, my information, I believe, is uh, I'm sure I can share it in the chat, or I'll share it, and. Um, I, you can reach out to me anytime with questions. Um, my team is very supportive. And as you can hear from all these authors, they've had a great experience and we want to encourage everyone to, to write. So uh, I really appreciate your attendance and uh, thanks to all the authors who have volunteered their time today and uh, also to write books for us. So you're really appreciated. So Donna, question for you. If someone is interested in writing for the ABA, uh, they can contact the ABA publishing office directly and you will kind of steer them through the process. Sure, actually the best way to, if you're interested in writing for us, the best way is to submit a proposal form. Uh, Sherry uh, shared the information at the very beginning of this um, in the chat. And if, if you would, if you submit a proposal, even if your idea isn't fully baked yet or you don't have a TOC and you don't have, um, you know, it, anything, you know, that you have at that point, a proposal form goes out to all of the staff so mm -hmm. we all talk about the proposals that come in and, you know, talk about where, you know, where they would fit. So I think um, that's probably the first step. But if you have questions before you submit the proposal, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to, to assist. Great. Uh, say, Donna, in your experience, I know you've worked with a lot of different authors and heard a lot of different stories from uh, different folks. Do you have any advice for an aspiring author? Maybe someone who's looking at writing for the ABA or... Sure. I think, uh, you know, it, it, I guess one of the things I would say is that, you know, we're, we're looking to publish on, on both broad topics and very niche topics. So sometimes you may, you may have an idea that you feel, oh, there might not be that many people interested in knowing about this, but we've published on some very niche topics and they've done really, really well. Uh, mm -hmm. Particularly if you have, uh, speak, you know, if you are involved in, in speaking engagements and you can promote your book through that um, way, or if, you know, obviously you have a client base where you can promote your book. Um, but, but no topic is, is I, I guess, 
guess uh, what, I, what I'm trying to say is anything is welcome. All topics are welcome. We're, we're willing to take a look at everything and it, you'd be surprised at some of the things that become bestsellers that we really, um, you know, we really aren't sure about in the beginning and they end up being a nice surprise. So um, sure. I would just say no, no idea is, is out of bounds. That sounds like good advice. So can you talk through uh, like some of the different things that ABA will do to uh, help promote someone's book maybe or? Uh, sure, sure, I'm books? happy to speak to that. So um, we will, uh, obviously we promote the book uh, to our own membership on our web store. Um, we have a discount for members, uh, which which is good. And we're working to kind of set some student student lawyer and young young lawyer pricing that, that makes it a little bit more um, easier for them to purchase books. Um, we, we also obviously have a third party distributor that sells all at our retail, you know, obviously Barnes and Noble, Amazon, all the big retailers. So, so we do distribute in that way. And we're really getting involved in licensing more in licensing books because that's sort of the way the market is moving. And so, um, you know, that's, we're trying to, to meet the, the customers and the readers where they are um, by having our content available on some of these bigger license, you know, legal, legal research platforms such as Westlaw, Bloomberg, Lexis, Wolters Kluwer. Um, mm -hmm. So, so you know, we're really trying to distribute, uh, strategically distribute our content uh, to the, the lawyers that, that need the information. That's great. Thanks, Donna. Thanks so much. Uh, next, we have uh, one of our advisors for the uh, GP Solo uh, Book Publication Board uh, is joining us today, uh, Melanie Bragg. Melanie, are you on? Oh, yeah. I'm oh, on. Hey, Melanie. Did, did you want to <laughs> chime in and say anything while we about publishing or, or anything at all? You are just doing such a great job with everything. Oh, thanks, I just love this. It's just, <laughs> it's so exciting to see and hear from these new authors that we have and with their experience and just sharing all about the process of writing books. I, it is, it is really, it's so much fun to write. I mean, when you're in that moment and you're really ripping it, you know, it's like being on a roller coaster. When I'm, when I'm really in the, in the groove, it almost like energizes me. I even have more energy than normal and it's just so much fun. But then that editing process, you know, you're going through the editing and, and then when the editor comes back and wants you to take a little bit out, because every word is like a baby to an author. I mean, I mean, every word is very important. So, you know, authors have to learn how to go through that editing process and trust the process. And I had a big session with my editor on my fiction book and boy, it, you know, I learned a lot. So I will always take the editor's advice from here on out, but it's, it's just a wonderful process. It's such an honor to be an ABA author. It's such an honor to get to work with ABA publishing and, and the book publications boards. And it's just so great to, you know, have the opportunity to bring in new authors and to educate people about what we do that is just so much fun. And also we're going to be talking a little bit this afternoon about how wonderful it is. You know, you may not make the direct money in your royalties. Yes, royalties are great, but the imprimatur that you get from being an author just increases your standing in the community because everybody wants to write one, but not everybody spends the time to do it. So, I didn't realize when I got into it what it was going to do for my law practice, what it was going to do for my self-esteem, what it was going to do for my world. And it's just been so great. So I encourage anybody who wants to write a book, we will help you, we will guide you, we'll shepherd you, and we'll, we may be a little hard on you every now and then, but you're still going to get there and it's going to be a good experience for everybody. So thank you for giving me a moment to share. Great. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, well, I'd like to thank all of our author participants today, uh, Michael, Armin, Gabe, and Darren, uh, for today's program. I'd also like to thank the ABA staff for making this program possible. Uh, we hope this program has helped answer some of your questions you may have as an aspiring author. If you have additional questions, please contact the ABA GP Solo Book Publication staff or the GP Solo Book Publication Board. And like Melanie was saying earlier, uh, don't forget that following this session uh, later today, we have the third and final uh, forum in our series. It's entitled, So You're Published, Now What? And this is a panel of ABA authors who will share their secrets to success as an ABA author, will teach you how to leverage your status as an ABA author in your career, and will provide tips on how to make the most of your author experience. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs>